is when you are usually refers to when you are trying to optimize your goal by uh, choosing what looks locally the best possible choice but without thinking whether this can affect your future choice or not. Now this is kind of pretty vague definition and uh, in fact it is not possible to characterize uh, in any more precise uh, um, way uh, uh, not only well uh, I guess the technique can be characterized by making a local choice um, even though of course this is already uh, exactly loose right but uh, and it's uh, even less possible to tell when the greedy solution will work and for that reason, sometimes greedy can be very tempting, but it can produce suboptimal uh, results. And for that reason, whenever you do something greedy, unless it's totally obvious, it's a very good idea to prove, uh, to kind of uh, um, persuade yourself that your solution is correct. So the proof doesn't have to be formal, right? But you just have to make sure that uh, um, you really uh, can guarantee that uh, uh, the solution is uh, correct. So let's uh, see an example. Um, so assume that you are um, running this university and you have a classroom and the university is open from I guess 8 a.m. to say uh, whatever uh, uh, say uh, 10 p.m. right and you have requests right uh, lecturers like very much to uh, preach so you have a whole bunch of people uh, that want to give lectures of different uh, uh, durations, right? And your goal is to schedule as many lectures as possible, right? So you want to anger as few people as possible, so you want to accommodate uh, as many lecturers as possible. How would you do that? So uh, the point here is that uh, you have to be, even when greedy works, you have to choose uh, very carefully the quantity that you are optimizing for. Uh, you see, this is much harder than real life. Uh, because what do you optimize in real life? money right so uh, <laughs> you don't have much choice there but uh, here the, in, in algorithms design you have to kind of carefully choose uh, what you are greedy but let's try to reason if i have a bunch of activities and i want to uh, schedule as many of them as possible which activities should i give uh, priority short one, short one. So naturally, you would say, if I want to fit as many of them as possible, I should try to start with the shortest ones, and lo and behold, this should give me the best result. What do you think? Is this true? How about if you have, say, only uh, how many, say, five activities, and they look like this. What will happen if I give priority to the shortest activity? You see, greedy, if you are greedy, if you try to optimize, if you try to conserve as much time as possible by picking always the shortest activities, you would take this activity here and you would take this activity here because all the remaining activities are much longer, but by taking this one 
you can no longer take this one, you can no longer take that one, and no longer can take that one, while if you took the longer activities, you could schedule three rather than two. Okay, so let's think again that if it's not the shortest one, and so let's start with early morning, I should minimize the waste of time, right? So maybe I should start with one that starts as early as possible. Would this work? If here it would work, lo and behold, if I start with this one, then this one will be ruled out, then I can pick that one, this one will be ruled out, and lo and behold, here it would work. But can you think of an example when it wouldn't work? How about if I have an activity that starts early, but it's uh, by a lecturer who really likes to talk a lot, or maybe <laughs> Tony Adolf wants, wants to give a speech to you, to your delight. <laughs> so if you choose this activity, Unfortunately, then it will block all other activities and it's no good. So, which activity should you then choose? How do you pick the activities? Okay, so that's, let's try that one. You would pick, the idea is, uh, you pick the activities that clash with the fewest number of other activities. Now, since you propose that, you have to help me find a counterexample why this doesn't work. Okay, so let's see. Uh, ones with clash, with clash with as few activities as possible. So this will break down if I have a situation that uh, uh, looks. Uh, oh. hmm? You just. You just have like one activity that doesn't clash with anything. And then I guess you just have other activities that kind of stack on each other. Just repeat it. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So you just have lots of uh, uh, activities that are overlapping. Uh, and then you have uh, one activity that, uh, uh, OK, so it would be like this. Sandwich, okay, you have to be more careful how you sandwich them. So you will have something that looks like this. So these activities now clash a lot. Um, and how do I, uh, these activities clash a lot. And then I have one activity that clashes only with the, well, not this. Three on the left. Now, unfortunately, this one will work. Uh, unfortunately. Okay, so here it is. Homework. <laughs> Show that if you pick activities that clash with the fewest number of activities, you can still uh, mess it up and not pick optimally. What would be uh, an example of uh, Gee, it's, sometimes it's not easy to come up with, uh, uh, with examples, or am I, maybe I'm just getting too old. Uh, so, um, the homework showed that picking uh, those that uh, clash uh, with fewest activities uh, Uh, will not work. Uh, um, and you know what? That shouldn't be actually 
to uh, difficult because, okay, so if I have also activities on this side, that looks like that, um, Oh, well, let's not... Uh, uh, so homework show that... Uh, find the counterexample for this design strategy. The key is... Uh, what is the activity that is kind of picking it is the least restrictive for all other activities? Uh, which activity is likely to cause... Uh, to rule out uh, as few activities as possible? Well, the shortest one we saw, it won't work. If you start from left to right, what is the activity that uh, definitely um, that is definitely likely to cause to uh, to exactly? So pick one that finishes first. So, if you pick the one that finishes first, what do we do in the next step? So, you pick one that finishes first. In this case, I have so many of them that it's hard to tell, so let me simplify it. So, you pick one that finishes first, so all other activities even if they start earlier. So why would this produce uh, the longest possible, the largest possible uh, choice of uh, non-conflicting activities? Uh, so it's not obvious, right, why this works. So the idea is uh, kind of very typical of how you verify that what you propose uh, is actually the best, or among the best because the problem can have multiple solutions. And it's called cut and paste argument. So take your optimal activity, so the optimal set of activities. So here is your timeline. And assume that this set of non-conflicting activities uh, is optimal. What you do then is you construct, you show that uh, you can morph this solution into a greedy solution without decreasing the quality of the solution. So we will show uh, kind of that gradually we can more that this activity cannot have more, sorry, this set of activities cannot have more activities than the one produced by the grid. Okay, if this was not produced by the greedy, it means that there exists at least one activity that was not chosen according to the greedy criteria. Okay, for the simplicity, because it's the first example that we are doing, assume that in fact, the first, there was an activity that finishes before the first activity of the optimal solution. So let me, okay, in the red is the optimal solution. Okay. And black is greedy. So uh, assume that the first activity is not picked according to the greedy Criterion. What can I do now? If I want to morph the optimal solution into the greedy solution without uh, uh, decreasing the number of activities, what can I do now? 
I want to make it appear that it is constructed by the grid. So instead of starting with this one, which one should I start with? I should start with that one that Greedy would pick. So I remove this activity and I add, so, my, so I will now have this activity and the remaining part uh, remain the same. Okay, now why is this still a correct solution? Why is this done overlapping? Exactly. You see, because if this does not interfere with the first activity, and this activity finishes before that one, then clearly no activity in from our choice can start before this activity finishes. Huh? Right? So I can replace this guy with the greedy choice without uh, any trouble, right? What do we do next? Well, we now look, so this is our new optimal activity. The first one is greedy choice, but the second one, for example, is not greedy because there is uh, an activity, uh, there is an activity that finishes earlier. What can I do now? Well, again, the very same reason, I can throw out this, the second activity, replace it with non-conflicting activity here, because how does greedy operate? After you choose the activity, you remove all conflicting activities, and then again you choose one that finishes the earliest. So we know that this activity is non-conflicting with that activity, but it cannot conflict with the subsequent activities because it finishes before the activity that was removed. And by assumption, this was, in fact, a non-conflicting set. So going one by one, you can uh, replace the entire optimal solution with the greedy, greedy solution without reducing the quality of solution, namely without decreasing the number of non-conflicting activities. So this is a very, very typical uh, uh, kind of reasoning. Uh, essentially, to show that greedy activity is optimal, you take every, any other optimal solution, you take a optimal solution, and then you morph it, and then you show that you can morph it into the greedy solution without uh, uh, decreasing the quality of the solution, in this case, without reducing the number of non-conflicting uh, activities. Uh, is it clear? No? Okay, let's go once again. Huh? So, how does Greedy operate? Huh? Greedy says the following. Huh? Pick as the first activity the activity that ends earliest. Huh? Remove all the conflicting activities and repeat. So pick the one that ends earliest, remove the conflicts, and among the remaining activities, again pick the one that ends earliest, remove the conflicting, and so forth. The claim is greedy will produce optimal solution. Why is this so? Well, take any optimal solution, say the red one is the best possible, with the largest possible of activities. We will show that the number of activities cannot be larger than greedy, the number uh, produced by the greedy. How we show that? Well, we show that we can morph the optimal solution into greedy solution without decreasing the number of activities. How do we go about that? Well, we say, assume that the first activity was not chosen by greedy. So, the first activity is not the one that ends earliest. Well, I'll take this optimal solution, 
drop the first activity and replace it with the one that finishes earliest. Now, the claim, so I dropped one and uh, attached one, so the number of activities is the same. Now we want to show that this is a correct solution, that there are no overlaps. But there cannot be overlaps. Why? Because all subsequent activities, because it's a consistent solution, right? All subsequent activities start after the end of this original activity. But the new re replacement ends before the end of that activity. Since these all activities start after this end, and this is earlier, clearly this will be after this end. So this activity cannot interfere with any subsequent activity. So now this is an optimal solution, right? Okay, so we now, uh, now you simply continue doing that, right? You take the second activity, right? And look what would greedy take as the second activity. Again, um, this activity will end before that activity. Why? Well, this activity is not interfering with that activity, right? So, any, and we chose among all the non-interfering activities, one that ends uh, the earliest, right? So, adding, replacing this with that, right, is okay on this side, right? On the other side, because we chose something that ends before the replaced activity ends, clearly it cannot interfere with the subsequent activities. And you can keep doing that, right, until you replace all the activities by the greedy choice. Because at each step, you maintain the number of activities. Yes? Well, the, that's, you see, the problem is uh, because we can assign uh, as soon as possible, it's not a proof that things no, work it's out. It's not a proof. Mm -hmm. It's a proof between the set of activities who has overlapped with this one, yeah. with the one that yes. ends first. The best one is the one that finished at first. In what sense is it the because, best one? Because we only allow to choose one between them. But what does it mean, the best? In what sense is it the best? Because it allows more activity to be assigned later. If we choose those that end later, yeah. we can. Uh, and yes. we are not, we are, and it is not possible to choose activity before that. Oh, OK, so, one, yeah, so, it is, uh, so you see, the, even though we do uh, the choice locally by taking one that finds earliest, it is the least, uh, so keeping it the least restrictive uh, uh, at every stage is guaranteed that, uh, uh, of uh, the optimality in the global selection. But you see, you have to be very, very careful because sometimes things look that uh, uh, they really work out when they don't. So you have to really kind of be careful to, that your justification is, uh, um, is, uh, is correct. Okay, so how about this? Uh, assume now that uh, rather than trying to optimize the number of activities, you want to optimize the total duration of activities. Uh, now assume first, for simplicity, that uh, all activities are of the same duration. How would you pick the list of activities uh, that uh, allows maximal total duration? Yeah. 
Exactly. <laughs> if all activities are of the same duration, then you simply have to maximize the total number of activities and it will optimize uh, the, uh, the total duration. But if the activities uh, are not of the same duration, how would you pick the activities to maximize the total duration? Any suggestions? Well, you see, this is an example that doesn't have a greedy solution. Even though it sounds very similar to this one, so maximizing the number of activities works with greedy, but maximizing the total duration doesn't, and it requires a new technique called dynamic programming. Uh, and it's kind of a non-trivial construction, we will see it uh, <coughs> uh, soon. So, if the, the activities are not all <coughs> of the same duration, things become much harder. Okay, so now let's look at another um, problem. Assume that you have a single machine and uh, you have a jobs, you have jobs that uh, uh, last different amount of time, so uh, T1, T2, uh, maybe T3, and so forth. Uh, uh, they are all of possibly different duration T4. And for every activity, you have the deadline by which it has to be completed. T1, D2, D3, D4. You so, clearly, <coughs> if you have lots of activities, and you have the start time, say you start at the time zero, right? And then you have your deadlines. Here is deadline D1, here is deadline D2, here is deadline, um, well, maybe deadline D4 is here, D5 is here, and I'm missing D3, here is D3. So if you have lots of activities, uh, clearly you cannot schedule them all to be completed uh, uh, on, on within the due deadline. Now, the lateness of activity is uh, uh, the finishing time uh, minus uh, the deadline di. Yeah? So, for example, if uh, your activity, if you schedule it uh, here, so the finishing time will be, uh, say this is the activity, uh, um, activity or uh, job uh, J4, right? And this is when you finish the finishing time of F4, then the deadline, for the delay for this activity is F4 minus D4. It simply tells you how much you went over the deadline. Okay? Your task is to schedule all the jobs so that the largest Uh, over the deadline, the largest delay is as small as possible. How would you do that? In what order would you schedule the activity? So again, uh, you have a bunch of jobs. Each job you know how long it takes to complete. Right? You have the duration uh, for each job, but you also have the deadlines. And so the delay of a, of a job is simply the finishing time minus the deadline, if uh, the finishing time is past the deadline. And what you want to minimize, you are looking for the job that got delayed the most. And you want to minimize that quantity. Are there conflicting jobs? 
Uh, okay, so you can do job, each job, so you have a single machine. So the jobs, uh, so you don't have the starting time and finish time. You have only how long it takes. And you have one single machine on which you can do the job. So you have how long it takes and you know by what time you have to finish it. And you can do at each time, you can do only one job. Aha. Uh -huh. So we are on the but there here you are not using the information that uh, uh, how long are the activities. Uh, but in fact, uh, you see that's a uh, kind of a subtle point. Uh, sometimes throwing out some of information might actually be harmless. It turns out that the best way to proceed is to order the activities to do the jobs in the ordering of their deadlines regardless of the duration of the jobs. And this is what we want to now show the point we call that this is in fact um, that this produces optimal solution. First of all, it's clear that the if you have an optimal solution, you can assume that uh, there are no uh, break, uh, breaks, that uh, your machine is never idle, because you can simply start uh, any other job that you have uh, immediately after you finish that job. So we can assume that all jobs are done consecutively without any gaps between them. So what we want to show is this, that if you always do, so this is deadline uh, bi, this is deadline b i plus 1, so here is uh, finishing time um, of activity i, and here is uh, finishing time of activity i plus 1. So what we want to show is that if we order the activities according to their deadlines, that, you, that we will get an optimal uh, solution. Yeah, I didn't do it here. We have one inversion, right? So, uh, so you're saying that I plus one is uh, so. Uh, so uh, this is the ordering. So this <coughs> violates the rule. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Now this uh, to show that this is optimal solution. Uh, again, we use uh, another trick that uh, is uh, ubiquitous in proving correctness of the uh, algorithms and we will do it also in case of dynamic programming and this is essentially the bubble sort. Okay. So consider the optimal solution and assume that it violates the greedy principle that says always do activities, activity with earlier deadline is done before the activity with later deadline. So if the solution is not a greedy solution, there must be an inversion, right? There must be two activities, say uh, activities A I and activity uh, A J, so that uh, the activity EI precedes uh, the activity, sorry, the deadline for activity, no, sorry, that uh, activity, ah, I'm messing it up. But. So you have two deadlines, uh, say uh, BJ and deadline BI. 
But you need an activity um, di, so this is where you do the job. Uh, okay, let's call activity A J, and somewhere here you did activity A I. So assume that this is the optimal solution, but it happens that one activity that has earlier, no, I messed it up again, wonderful, I and J is here, right? So that activity with the later deadline was done before the activity with earlier deadline. Okay. Now you see, idea. How would I show that uh, this cannot be better than the greedy solution? Ideally, if I swap these two activities. Uh, Right? Uh, then, and if I can show that I, the nothing changed, right, I would be fine. But swapping these activities because they have different duration will be messing up all the activities in between and all the um, uh, latencies will be changed. So it's not clear. Um, because you see here, if this activity is longer than activity AI, right? If I put it here and put AI here, if I exchange them, then I can cause mess because now all the activities that follow, now if the situation would be like this, here is AJ and somewhere here is AI, but now all the activities in between got delayed. So this might affect the, uh, what is the um, largest possible delay. So swapping them around is no good because I mess up activities in between. When is the only situation when nothing messes up uh, activities in between? Hmm? When they are next to each other. So if the activities are next to each other and they simply swap them, the only change in the uh, in the difference between the finishing time and the deadlines will happen for these two activities, right? Because if they look like this, uh, so here is. Uh, Right? They might look like this, and then this activity, okay, I have this activity simply got moved here, and this activity moved here, right? And nothing, no other disturbances were caused because this is still perfectly lined up. Because only these two, the sum total of the duration is the same, so this remains static, right? So no trouble will happen with other activities, save these two, if they are adjacent. But I might have inverted activities that are not adjacent. What do we do in such circumstances? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think if there are two that are different, that are, one comes before the other in the wrong order, then there's another pair somewhere else that are adjacent and still. Ah, that's the trick. So you see, the point is exactly how bubble sort operates. Bubble sort swaps only, always only adjacent elements, and yet accomplishes. Uh, perfect order, right? So it is enough to show that swapping adjacent activities will not uh, 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 ruin the solution, will not make the solution suboptimal. Because I can restrict myself always performing only swaps between adjacent activities. Yes. 
Yes. So here, you see here, that's exactly what I did. I swapped adjacent activities. But you see, I might have inversions that are not adjacent. Huh? But, um, uh, but this can be ignored huh? because uh, I can always bubble sort. Huh? It's enough to show that swapping adjacent activities is OK. Because then I can resolve uh, these conflicts as well, right? Simply by always swapping the adjacent activities and by bubble sort, right? Uh, then uh, I can uh, uh, avoid all the inversions. Uh, I can put them in order. So that's important thing to see is that it is enough to uh, swap only adjacent activities. Okay, but what can happen? If the deadline was here, uh, just like here, what will happen if I if the activities are uh, adjacent and I uh, do the swap? If I do the swap, then this will become the finishing time fi, right? Well, let's call it fi star, right? And uh, somewhere here, I will have, uh, OK, so what I'm trying to show you here is uh, that if they are inverted, uh, you see, what is the longest delay? The longest delay here is, so uh, let me just put it back in order that it was i, and this is i plus 1. So, what will happen when I swap these activities? Uh, you see here, obviously, maximal penalty is this one. After I swap, uh, right? Can I be? Can I exceed uh, uh, this overstay? Uh, okay. So think about this. Why swapping adjacent activities? Uh, will not increase uh, the maximal delay. We will come back, uh, because we are out of time, we will come back to this tomorrow. So think why swapping adjacent activities is OK.